Okay, perfect. We'll go ahead and get started then. Uh, we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. Good morning. Welcome to the board meeting of the Osteopathic Medical Board of California. This meeting is being held on January 19th, 2023, and the time is 9.09 .09 on my watch. Um, this meeting is occurring at the Department of Consumer Affairs Hearing Room located at 1747 North Market Boulevard, Sacramento, California, 95834. Today's meeting will be conducted using the following guidelines. All participants will mute their microphone or phone during each presentation of the agenda topic. Board members who wish to provide additional comments should select the raise hand feature next to their name. This will alert the host and the chair that you have additional comments. At the conclusion of discussion from the board members, I will ask for public comment. At the conclusion of the discussion period, I will call for a vote if necessary or move to the next agenda item. In all, in, all in attendance should keep their comments specific to the agenda item being discussed. An opportunity for public comment for items not on the agenda will be provided. Please be advised that during this comment period, the board cannot engage in discussions or take action on any matter that is raised except to decide whether to place the matter on the agenda of a future meeting. We'll move on to agenda item two. Machiko, if, can you establish a quorum and call the roll? Good morning. Gore Adamian. Dr. Buhari. Present. Dr. Jensen. Present. Claudia Mercado. Present. Andrew Marino. Present. Dr. Patel. Present. Denise Pine. Present. Present. Thank you. A quorum has been established. Okay, we'll move to agenda item number three, the reading of the board's mission statement. Agenda item number three, um, with a quorum established, we will have Dr. Jensen read our mission statement, at which point we'll move to the next agenda item. The mission of the board is to protect the public by requiring competency, accountability, and integrity in the safe practice of medicine by osteopathic physicians and surgeons. Thank you. And we'll move on to item number four on the agenda, which is public comment on items not on the agenda. During the meeting today, public comment is welcome on any agenda item as the item is taken up by the board. Under the Open Meeting Act, the board may not take any action on issues raised by public comment that are not on the agenda, other than to decide whether to schedule that issue for a future meeting. In order to allow the board sufficient time to conduct its scheduled business, the board will limit the time given to each person to two minutes. It is not necessary to repeat statements or views of a previous speaker. It is sufficient to state that you agree. As a reminder, please do not disclose details of an active enforcement case or licensing matter as this may compromise the board's ability to hear the case later. The board appreciates your cooperation and assistance in meeting its legal mandate. At this time, are there any public comments on items not on the agenda? Moderator, is there anyone requesting to public comment? This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment for items not on the agenda, uh, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests. Right, and it looks like we do have um, one comment from individual logged in as Michelle Montserrat Ramos. And Michelle, um, you'll be given two minutes to speak and a 15 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. All right, and you are unmuted. Good morning, my name is Michelle Montserrat Ramos and I'm with Consumer Watchdog. I've been monitoring and advocating with the Medical Board of California for 17 years. I just began joining your meetings with my team a year ago. Prior to this meeting, you did not have time limitations for public comment. 
I notice that you do now. One thing that comes to mind is that every time the board discusses an issue, the primary question is, what does the medical board do? Since the primary concern is what the medical board does, why would you choose to not adopt the same public participation guidelines that they have? Your time limitation of two minutes per person and 10 minutes total per agenda item is inadequate. You are not giving the public adequate time to engage with you. I'm requesting that you adopt the medical board's public comment guidelines of three minutes per person and 40 minutes total for public comment not on the agenda and three minutes per person and 20 minutes total for items on the agenda. The president of the medical board takes all public comment regardless of time. I recommend you do the same. For this meeting, since agenda item 14 was placed on the agenda to the, due to the work of our team, I'm requesting that you take all members of the public who wish to speak on that agenda item and for the future adopt the mega board's guidelines for public comment. These restrictions are sending the public a message that you do not want to hear from us. Since we appear to be the only members of the public that engage with you, this is the message we are receiving. We will continue to work with you until you adjust these limitations. Thank you. All right, uh, this is the moderator and it appears there are no further requests for public comment. Would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please, that'd be fine. Thank you for your comments. Uh, seeing that there's nobody left to comment, uh, we'll move on to item number five on the agenda, which is review and possible approval of the minutes. Um, this is for August, September, and October 2022 teleconference board meetings and proposed 2023 meeting calendar. Is there any discussion by the board? Motion to adopt. Okay, so we'll have a motion to adopt, and was that uh, Claudia? Denise Pines. Oh, that's Denise, okay. Ms. Pines, there's a motion. Uh, do we have a second? I'll move second. To it's been moved and seconded. Moderator, is there anyone requesting to public comment on approval of the minutes? This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A panel for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access those features and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please. So at this time, Machika, will you do a roll call vote, please? Gore Damian. Here. Dr. Buhari. Yes. Dr. Jensen. Yes. Claudia Mercado. Yes. Andrew Marino? Yes. Dr. Patel? Yes. Denise Pine? <clears throat> yes. Motion carries. Uh, this is Michael Knotes, Legal Counsel. Uh, me Member Damien, I just wanted to, uh, to uh, confirm that your vote was aye. I think you said here. We're glad you're with us now. Yes, it's aye. Thank you. The motion carries. Uh, now we'll move on to agenda item number six, which is the president's report. And I don't have a lot to report except that we have a new executive officer. Um, and I can tell you there were, there were pretty big shoes to fill with how well Mark uh, managed the board, but she has hit the ground running and is just a force to be reckoned with. Um, and and uh, I wanna welcome her to the board and just uh, commend her on all the work she's done so far in such a short period of time getting things organized. So, Erica, Thank did you. Erica Calderon, everybody. 
Thank you, Dr. Bahari, members of the board. Um, Erica Calderon, Executive Director of the Osteopathic Medical Board of California here. I'd just like to take a moment to say thank you for allowing me to serve as your director. I am very humbled to be here today and very excited for this opportunity. I'd also like to thank my staff for such a warm welcome. Macho Goa couldn't do it without you. And to say that I'm looking forward to the many things that we're gonna do together. Very good, and you'll, you'll see a little bit different format for how the meeting goes today. And today is a long meeting, but we'll, we'll manage through. And I'm gonna, of course, lean on, uh, on Erica frequently. Um, any discussion by members of the board? Uh, this is Claudia. Can we just uh, say the date, the, the starting date for Erica, just for the record, the first day? Yes, absolutely. It was November 1st. Congrats. Thank you. Moderator, is there anyone requesting public comment? Uh, this is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click that Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And I'll pause a moment to allow uh, members of the public time to access those features. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please. <clears throat> we'll move on to agenda item number seven, which is the executive director's report. And we'll have uh, our executive director, Erica Calderon. Thank you, Dr. Bahari, members of the board, Erica Calderon, executive director of the Osteopathic Medical Board of California here to provide you with my executive report. After each section, I will stop for board questions, and after my report, we will open it up for public comment. Starting off with administrative services, currently the board has 13.9 authorized positions with two half-time positions that are vacant, one which is part of the board's licensing program and the other which is part of the enforcement program. The board is happy to announce the recruitment of Andrea Harmon, Ms. Harmon joined the Osteopathic Medical Board of California in October of this year and is currently acting as the board's front desk receptionist. Prior to joining OMBC, Andrea worked for several insurance companies processing and managing premium payments. I am also happy to announce that as of last week, the board has filled its full-time permanent staff services analyst position in our licensing unit which will be responsible for reviewing and approving initial DO applications. Ms. Gabriela Gonzalez will be joining the OMBC family this upcoming Monday, and we couldn't be happier to have her join us. Ms. Gonzalez received a bachelor's degree in business administration from Sacramento State University and has many years of private sector experience where she analyzed and processed legal referrals. I'm also happy to announce that the board has advertised for a staff services manager one as a limited term basis to act as the board's licensing program manager. The window to submit applications for this position has closed and the board plans to conduct interviews this upcoming weeks. We do hope that we can establish this position as a permanent status position through a budget change proposal in the future. As mentioned, there is an allocated half-time staff services analyst vacant position in our licensing program, which we plan to advertise very soon. This position was received through legislative budget change proposal and will handle all the workload associated with complying with Senate Bill 806, which includes the manual adding of modifiers to the, to the brief system to help identify and track licensees who must comply with new licensing requirements. The other vacant position is a half-time medical consultant position for our enforcement program. It has been decided to hold off on hiring for this position at this time and utilize the funds allocated to this position to fund a lim that limited term licensing program manager. It is worth mentioning that the board currently contracts with 135 medical consultants and expert reviewers who present a wide range of specialties 
and already assist the board with the daily review of cases. In addition, we are working on adding more consultant, consultants and expert reviewers to our current list, particularly consultants and experts with expertise and knowledge in reviewing and, and acknowledging and reviewing um, inappropriate prescrib prescribing cases. Out of all the ex exciting things that I do have to report to you today, I do have some not so happy news, at least for OMBC. Mr. Corey Sparks, who has served the board as lead enforcement analyst, has officially accepted a promotional opportunity with the Medical Board of California. Mr. Sparks will serve the Medical Board as a staff services manager one in their central complaint unit. I do want to take a moment to wish him well in his new managerial role and in his future endeavors. We do plan to post for his position in the next couple of weeks. Congratulations, Corey. On another sad note, our legal counsel, Mr. Michael Canotes, who is present here today with us and who has served the board for several years, will slowly transition out of his role. As we have been assigned a new legal counsel who is also present here today, John Ken. I'd like to go ahead and welcome him and um, mention that um, I am very happy um, to actually have Mr. Michael uh, be the um, legal counsel for this short time in my transitional period. Uh, Michael and I know each other from the physical therapy board, so it was great to have him here to assist me in my first couple of days and I do look forward to working with uh, Mr. Kin. Lastly, the board is exploring what positions it can create immediately as limited term positions through its blanket authority and using current funds to support these positions and what positions it will request to, through a budget change proposal in spring and in the future. Moving along to an update on technology and outreach, if we can please have the QR codes uh, up. I am extremely happy and excited and to announce that we now have our Facebook and Twitter accounts up and running. I'd like to thank Peter from DCA's Public Affairs Office for creating these two accounts very quickly and for assisting the board with all of the daily updates to the new established accounts as well as our LinkedIn profile. The board hopes that we can utilize these social media accounts to improve board awareness, create interest for the osteopathic profession and allow the board to be more engaged and transparent with our osteopathic community, the public, our consumers, and all of our stakeholders. On December 1st, the board met with the Department of Consumer Affairs website and redesign team to start the process of redesigning our webpage. The board hopes to start this pro project very soon we like to renovate the page, make it more user-friendly, innovative, and at the same time more efficient for our stakeholders. I do have to say that this will be a very lengthy process as the board has a lot of cleanup to do to its current content uh, before converting into the new template. In addition, there are many other boards within the department that are also currently working with DCA's team to do the same. So with that said, it is very hard to set a completion date on the project, but we do hope to have this completed by the end of this fiscal year or early next. In terms of outreach, there are two PowerPoint presentations underway the board intends to put together, and that is to create a presentation on the board's application process and a, and a presentation on the laws and regulations pertaining the practice of osteopathic medicine. Once the licensing manor, manager is onboarded, the plan is to start reaching out to the three osteopathic medical schools here in California to set up presentations to all of our students. The presentations will provide guidance on licensure requirements, the application process itself, in addition will provide regulation awareness to promote consumer protection. There are also plans to tag team with the Osteopathic Physicians and Surgeons of California Association on these efforts at this time, this does conclude my administrative update. Before I move on to the licensing program, I do like to open it up for questions on this topic. Thank you, Erica. Any discussion from members of the board? Yeah, uh, thank you, Erica. That was uh, uh, a really good update. And I'm happy to hear that we're going to be working on redesigning the website. Um, it can be a very 
Uh, it's been described to me as a very bulky process for us licensees to get relicensed and find information um, uh, quickly. Um, I feel like the website right now is more geared towards consumers, but we have to remember that our role is not only enforcement and protection of the public, but also providing licensure. And um, making it more user-friendly for the licensees is a huge step in the right direction. Thank you. It's definitely a project right on, on the horizon. Is there any more questions? Any more comments from board members? Um, this is Denise. I just want to um, welcome Erica, and I can see you've got a fast start <laughs> out the box, um, which is exciting. I think the things that you're tackling is great. Um, I um, thank Corey for his service. That I've been here. He's been really great to work with, um, as well as um, Michael. Thank you, Ms. Pines. Do we have another comment? Oh, can yes, I also I add, um, oh, sorry. <clears throat> I want to thank Michael and Corey, too. This is my first time meeting both of you. I've actually worked with Corey for uh, many years. Prior to my appointment, I was an expert reviewer and worked really closely with him. So uh, he'll, be, he'll be missed greatly. But both, both you and uh, Corey will be missed greatly. Hi, this is Claudia. Thank you, Corey, and thank you, Erica. Um, what wanted to just touch on the technology side. Uh, if you can uh, uh, brief us on anything that's uh, updates to Greece, because I know that when you um, start tackling the website, there is a licensing part for the for the uh, positions, and they have to use Breeze. Um, have you engaged with with that at this time? Thank you, Claudia. Um, yes, I, I do have experience from other prior boards and engaging with the Breeze Agile groups, but Terry Thorfinson, my um, manager, um, is actually the one that spearheads that, um, that project of meeting regularly. Um, they actually, DCA conducts um, daily, it seems like, meetings um, just to stay on, on top of everything, and we are partnered up with other um, allied health groups such as PA and the Medical Board of California. Right, just want to make a note, uh, one suggestion. So if you can maybe advocate for Breeze itself to also work on updating their um, user interface with the licensees. Um, it's not really our website, it's, the, it's whatever plugin we use to log into their system that's really bulky. Uh, and then it transitions to how, you know, uh, our uh, physicians actually find that link to get to Breeze. Um, so just wanted to point that out and make a note there uh, that that user experience could be improved, but that it has to come from Breeze, I believe so. Uh, the other thing for branding, I love that you're um, doing the LinkedIn and the Facebook. Uh, one thing that just jumped on me from the branding side on that Facebook um, page is that, you know, the imagery at the top, you have two, two male physicians and one female and the females in the back. So I, as a board member, I wanna advocate for our branding to be strategic and to be thoughtful um, and moving forward, I would love to propose to the board that we advocate for more women physicians on the board. Um, so when you go speak to students, uh, maybe do promote uh, the diversity within the osteopathic field and just make it very clear uh, where we are in terms of, you know, female uh, physicians. I think that would really benefit the board and, um, and the overall state. Uh, also, back to the website, I think if we can push it to six to nine months, that would be great. I know there's a, there's a backlog um, with DCA, but we have been actively asking for this, I think, for the last two to three years. So I would just ask you to see if we can um, maybe prioritize this. As it was mentioned, the physicians do log in for licensing, and we are trying to increase our numbers and make that experience better. Um, that's it. Any questions for you in terms of what I just said? Um, I know I said all, a few things there. No questions. Um, thank you. I did take notes on, on all of the requests, and um, I am working with them, meeting with them. Right now what they asked me to do is, is essentially identify all the content that we do not want to transfer over to the next template to make it easier for updates to happen at a later time. 
We are um, just at this very early stages of identifying what's in each page. And I myself have, you know, been going through them. And then um, what they've asked me to do also is just um, start off with identifying what type of template I like to, we like to go ahead and move forward with and the color scheme. So we're just in the very initial um, stages. I, you know, I do have to partner up with DCA to see when they have the time to work with us. So it's a collaboration effort. And as I previously mentioned, there are other boards that are working on this project with them at the same time. So it, it's sort of on the list of priorities, whoever joined them first. <laughs> so we'll try our, our very um, best to keep it moving along for sure. Yeah, and uh, if you can provide us with timelines in terms of you know holding the DC accountable for deliverables, I think the most important thing for me is the how user friendly it is to physicians logging in and finding information. Um, and then also, you know, if you can tell us when you know when the launch day will be, because I know there has to be, we have to guarantee that all the information is correct. So we'd love to know, or for the board to know when that's going to happen. So um, it's a it's a pretty seamless transition. I will even suggest getting some of the physicians here on the board involved, just for for any insight they can provide you on the user experience. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, thank you. Welcome. I look forward to working with you for as long as I can stay on the board. <laughs> thank you, Claudia. There's no more comments. We can move on. Yeah, I'll just say um, it's been a pleasure working with Corey and congratulations on your promotion and good luck with your next endeavor. And Michael, likewise, it's been nice working with you. All right. Uh, any any comments from members of the public moderator on that first part of the executive director's report? This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests. And it looks like we have a request for comment from uh, Michelle Montserrat Ramos and Michelle, once again, you'll be given 2 minutes to speak in a 15 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. All right, and you are unmuted. Good morning. I am Michelle Montserrat Ramos and I am with consumer watchdog. I work with families across the state of California who have been harmed or lost family members due to medical negligence. I also am one of those families. We work on issues concerning medical negligence, maternal mortality, regulatory board reform, and I work with families across the state to help them navigate the enforcement process. We would like to welcome President Erica Calderon we see the difference in enforcement statistics and the additional speakers on the agenda, providing more information for the public and the board. We appreciate it. We look forward to working with you. We would like to thank Corey Sparks for his service. He worked with us and did his best to provide information and we greatly appreciate that and wish him on his new endeavor with the Mega Board of California. Thank you. All right, this is a moderator. It appears there are no further requests for public comment. Would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank you for those comments. I'll kick it back to Erica for continuation. Moving along to an update on the board's licensing program. As previously reported in past board meetings, the board is exper experiencing a backlog in its applications and has high processing times. However, as referenced in the staffing considerations, the board is exploring adding new positions to address this issue very quickly and eliminate and prevent future backlogs. And the board's past approach of redirecting key staff from other units to assist with applications. In addition to adding staff, the board is already starting the conversation of transitioning all from all of our paper applications to Breeze. We have already done so with our postgraduate training licenses, and we would like to make the same transition for our physician and surgeon licenses as well. We just want to establish adequate staffing before we can do so. 
Currently, we are only accepting these as hard copy and converting the breeze will save us a lot of processing times. There are some important legislative licensing changes that went into effect recently or will be going into effect soon that I do want to bring to your attention today and others that Terry will cover in her legislative report. On January 1st, the elimination of the prorata license fee and license cycle went into effect. This was requested by the board from the legislator, legislator to eliminate the birth month issuance of a license and the prorata fee. All licenses issued after January 1st, 2023 will be charged the full licensure fee of $447 and will expire every two years. Last year, um, the renewal period was expended, extended to uh, 120 days. This change was made in Breeze when SB 806 was implemented and the purpose of extending the renewal window was to provide licensees additional time to complete their renewals. In October of 2022, reminder postcards for renewals went into effect. This change eliminated the bulky 14-page renewal application from being printed and mailed out for all renewals, saving the board postage expense, breeze expense, and workload. At this time, I would like to move on to present our licensing program statistical reports. If we can start by referring to agenda item 7B1, which is our application services stats. This report is a licensee population report for all, all of our license types. As you can see, the board currently has a total of 13,509 physicians and surgeons. 1,370 postgraduate training licensees and 1,180 fictitious name permits. If we can now refer to agenda item 7B2, this report covers our application services statistics for quarter one and quarter two of this fiscal year 2022-2023, and it reports the total number of applications received and the total number of applications approved and it provides you with a comparison to our numbers from last fiscal year, quarter one and quarter two. This is a very significant report for the board to see today. As you can see, our total number of applications received has increased by 82% in compared to last year. This is a very huge and significant increase that unfortunately staffing levels can't compete with at this time, which is why we are prioritizing the need to add staff. We attribute this growth to come from the added postgraduate training license type and of course our peak time of application submitted after the completion of the PTL and graduation. In terms of applications approved, you can see that despite the board's backlog with the increase, we have approved 21% more applications this year so far in comparison to last year at this very same time. So I'd like to take a moment to thank staff. I know we've done an all hands on deck approach the moment I walked in to the door. And um, this board actually was the board that taught me how to license a physician for the very first time. So thank you. <laughs> the last report is, um, the, the last report is agenda item 7B3, which is a three year licensing maintenance statistical report which also illustrates for you a percentage change in the last two fiscal years. What needs to be pointed out in this report is just simply, again, that our applications are increasing each year. In the last two fiscal years, there was a 76% increase in the physicians and surgeons section, a slight decline of 5% in postgraduate training licenses, and a 2% increase in our fictitious name permits. We ended our fiscal year 2021-2022 with a high processing time, as previously mentioned, especially for our physician and surgeon applications. The processing numbers that you are seeing incorporate the time from the initial submission of the application to the time that all the application deficiencies are met to the moment that we approve the application. The board had a 51% increase in our processing times in comparison to last year it is roughly taking us about seven months to license our physicians, and that is a huge concern. But as mentioned, we have new staff joining us on Monday and a manager coming soon that we hope to see the operations of, these, of this unit improving very quickly. Um, and we're seeing the, the light at the end of the tunnel. 
Um, this concludes my update on the licensing report, and I'd like to go ahead and open it up for questions before we move on to enforcement. Any questions from board members? Yeah, I had a question. Um, have we uh, ever discussed the interstate medical licensing compact or um, uh, talked about that as, more, as kind of an avenue to help uh, our physicians get their licenses a little bit more efficiently. Um, with the COVID pandemic, telemedicine has pretty much exploded, and the development of this compact allows physicians kind of like a TSA pre-check. So if they meet certain criteria, um, they get their license uh, in a given state that participates in the compact instantly. I think about 37 states uh, participate currently. Um, unfortunately, California is not one of them. For us to participate, we would have to uh, bring this to legislature and it has to be signed into law. So just wondering if that's been discussed in the past or um, uh, I don't even know if this is not appropriate because it's not on the agenda, but if it's something that we support, um, just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we've brought it up at a prior meeting. We could put it as an agenda item for the next meeting and see if we look into it, at least get that conversation started. I think it's not an unreasonable thing. Good morning. Uh, welcome, Dr. Director Calderon. Uh, I do have a question. You mentioned that the current processing time for applications is around approximately seven months. I'm wondering what do you kind of perceive we want to be able to get that down to for any future applicants that are watching so they can just kind of be aware of what our future goal would be? I can tell you my future goal is two weeks. <laughs> um, other boards and bureaus are averaging about uh, roughly 30 days to 60 days. Um, and then there's some that are overachievers that are off, you know, and they're obviously fully staffed and have, um, you know, better means of, of already having um, their applications up and running in Breeze that are um, running at a two-week uh, turnover. And so um, with that said, there are a lot of projects on my horizon, one of them going in and figuring out how we can get our applications into Breeze very quickly. Um, bringing on staff is going to help tremendously. Having bodies is just um, it's key to, to making our processing you know, in, in, increase, uh, definitely. Thank you for that feedback, I appreciate it. Any other this comments from, oh, go ahead, Claudia. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that too. You know, as you're taking on these projects uh, with Breeze and the website, and again, going back to how do we capture all this information, um, it'd be great if you can just run a few trials of what this new licensing process will look like and uh, really advocate to push it forward uh, or as fast as possible through BCA to help you guys. If, we, if there's any way to automate this, that can maybe help take some of that weight off your shoulders. Uh, so we'd like to know, you know, if you can tell us what, what is working versus uh, what is something that it's not working? Like what is your biggest bottleneck right now for licensing? Thank you, Claudia. It's definitely the staff. Um, we only have one full-time individual dedicated to doing applications right now. Um, so bringing on another staff member that's also going to be a full-time staff member um, is going to def it's going to, you know, make an impact. The manager itself, um, you know, I've historically been a working manager, so um, that's, that seems to always be the case when it comes to DCA and, and our backlogs. We, we tend to jump in and assist whenever, whenever we can. So um, that is also going to be helpful. Just bringing on that leader that is going to have that adequate time to meet with other boards. We did have um, DCA conduct a licensing enlightenment program and that document was shared with me. So we will be reviewing that together um, just to see what we can do to improve our efforts on our end. That's great. And just final point, I think it was mentioned about the compact um, license i think that's the federation of medical boards they have presented to us in the past i've been on the board for 10 years and i think they've um come and talked to us about three to four times they're giving us the giving of the presentation so um i'm i'm okay with you know maybe putting a, another agenda item because it's a pretty robust conversation 
So um, if we're going to do that, maybe we can set a good um, chunk of time for that. And as well, I would love for the public to attend for that conversation. Um, thank you. Any other discussion by board members? If not, we will entertain comments from the public moderator. Anyone requesting public comment at this time? This is the moderator and at the direction of a uh, uh, board, I've opened up the Q and a feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q and a icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And then it looks like um, we also have a raised hand from um, board member Mercado. I don't know if that was left over from. Okay, it was left over. <laughs> um, so I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access those features and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Well, thank you for those comments. We'll move on to, are we on 7D now? 7C. 7C. 7C, back to Erica. Okay, enforcement program. Um, I can foresee several projects on the horizon in this area as well. Um, having several years of experience in enforcement, I do plan to look into the entire enforcement process of the board to see what improvements can be made. At this time, I am happy to announce that in terms of our consumer complaints, staff and myself started by updating our consumer complaint form, which is now available on our webpage. There, were, there was a need to improve this form to make it more easy to, easier to read, fill out, and gather upfront investigative documents that at times our consumers may not be aware that are essential part of the investigations. Instructions were added to the front page to encourage our complainants to attach a copy of any supporting documents they may have in their possession, such as patient medical records, photographs, audio or video recordings, correspondence such as letters, emails, text messages, billing statements, proof of payments, police report, court documents, or any internal employment administrative investigation records. In addition, we attached our release forms to the complaint itself and adding more space to the allegations section to allow complainants to provide a more robust summary of their incidents in question. By doing all of this, enforcement staff hopes to save intake processing time, gather essential evidence and speed up the process of our complaints and in turn provide greater and faster consumer protection. After meeting with enforcement staff, it was also identified that roughly 50% of OMBC's complaints get routed directly to the Medical Board of California in error instead of OMBC. This creates extra work for both boards, an impact to both of the board's statistical measures, an impact to our statute of limitations, and most importantly, an early intervention to the protection of OMBC's consumers. The board has reached out to the Medical Board of California to get their assistance in redirecting our consumer population our way. In addition, our, our board will work on efforts to improve our board's awareness so that as this is a very critical um, thing to point out that our complaints, our complaints should be redirected our way. To help with case aging, the enforcement pro program will be implementing monthly case reviews that will be conducted on the last week of every month to help case mo cases moving along. In addition, enforcement staff is now receiving individualized monthly pending reports, which highlight important high priority cases, short statute of limitation cases, and any age case that is above the 180 day performance measure for the desk investigations. The board also has started the process of getting enforcement staff access to LexisNexis which is a public records database. This database will allow staff to look up information such as addresses and phone numbers. This becomes extremely helpful in those instances where our consumers fail to include their contact information and we need to gather a medical release to be able to gather the records for our review. In addition, where a licensee fails to maintain a current address of record and we are unable to get a response from the licensee. 
Enforcement staff will be less limited, conduct better desk investigations, decrease their processing times, and provide a better product before referring any of their cases to the Division of Investigations Office. In terms of communication with other stakeholders, monthly meetings with the Division of Investigation Office has been established. These meetings are conducted on the last Thursday of each month between myself and the supervising special investigator over DFI's enforcement support unit, Ms. Melissa Doss, and the chief of DFI, Ms. Kathleen Nichols. The goal is to, open, to establish an open line of communication between the board and the investigative staff to discuss enforcement-related matters that may impact both of our departments. I am meeting regularly with the Attorney General's office and consulting with our legal counsel on a frequent basis. The last update involving enforcement that I have for you today is that we have the much anticipated presentation regarding the enforcement process to give to you later this afternoon. And we will be working on putting together a consultant expert training program in the near future. At this time, I'd like to go ahead and move on to present our enforcement program statistical reports. If you can please refer to agenda item 7C1, which is the board's enforcement statistics for quarter one and quarter two of this fiscal year 2022-2023 which will compare our current numbers to last year's quarter one and quarter two. And agenda item 7C2, which is a three-year enforcement performance measure report. For our quarter statistics, the board has received a total of 229 consumer complaints and 14 total arrests and convictions for a grand total of 243 complaints year to date. These numbers are reported in performance measure one, which is our complaint intake. As you can see by our, our spreadsheet, consumer complaints had a slight decline of 27% in comparison to last year. We attribute this to less COVID complaints coming in, and also the increase in convictions and arrests are attributed to the nation leading back to enormity after a national pandemic. People are going out again, and the court systems are moving faster in their proceedings. The target for performance measure two, which is complaint initiation, is set by statute at 10 days. This is the average number of days it takes for the board to initiate a complaint and acknowledge it. The board's average in fiscal year 2021-2022 was 24 days. And I am extremely happy to report that in quarter one of this fiscal year, enforcement staff brought that down to 14 days. And most recently in quarter two, we have brought that down to three days. The board has referred 18 cases for further investigation to the Division of Investigations year to date, and they currently have 41 pending cases this quarter. For performance measure three, which is our investigation time cycles and for DFI and performance measure four, which is our cycles for the Attorney General's office, cage aging is declining this year for both departments. These numbers are known to fluctuate year to year as one or two very complicated cases can increase these numbers substantially. A little, a little later today, you will hear from both of the departments directly. For agenda item 7C2, which is the board's three-year milestone statistics, we see a steady number of complaints being received each, each year. The board, is, the board is averaging about 600 complaints. The case initiation is improving as previously stated and overall case, case aging is declining. At the bottom of this uh, graph, I have included some disciplinary numbers for you to review. As you can see, our numbers of cases being referred to the AG's office are increasing, which are accounting for more accusations being filed. At this time, this does conclude my enforcement program update and I'd like to go ahead and open it up for questions on the enforcement process before I bring up Mr. Corey Sparks to give you an update on probation. Any questions from board members? Uh, I have a question. Uh, I think it's also important to recognize, you know, when the board does well, and I, meant, I know you mentioned that we were able to bring down the intake of the complaints now under the statutory time period of 10 days to now three. I'm wondering if you could just kind of discuss what were some of the things that attributed to that success? I think it was really just having a discussion with enforcement staff explaining the law and explaining that um, before anything else when it comes to enforcement, that is key and number one, it is tied to a statute 
And even though we do have to keep in mind our case aging, we have to actually acknowledge the receipt of our complaint. It is what starts the process in our communication with our consumers. And um, just acknowledging that we have it in hand um, makes it at ease for our consumers to know that we're gonna start looking at it. So in reality, it's the law that allows it. <laughs> Appreciate that, thank you. I had a couple questions. Uh, on our website, does it have a status for people that put in accusations or for the public that submits an accusation, what, which part of the process their complaint is at? And on the same token, is this something that the accused can see where, what, what phase, uh, do you know what I mean? Uh, what phase uh, the, the complaint is in? I think the question is referring to whether or not we have transparency for the complaint process. Um, we do not post anything on the web because our complaints are confidential. Um, our consumers, once they file their complaint or our complainants, they receive that acknowledgement letter with the case number assigned to them, and they're welcome to give us a call at any time to get an update. Um, the first public document in regards to discipline is the accusation, and that is posted on our web. That is the first charging document against a physician uh, that spells out what we are um, filing you know, against them, and that is the very first document that is public. So to answer the question in regards to the consumer complaints, no, we do not post anything on the web, but we do have staff. We have a analyst who is sort of the analyst of the day. They take on that role, and they're happy to answer any questions and provide any updates at any time. And I know you mentioned the cases referred to AG have gone up. So I could imagine that we might need more expert reviewers. Um, I personally have gotten uh, solicited with emails like asking me, um, obviously I can't because I'm, on, I'm uh, on the board, but um, do we have a plan or do we have a shortage of expert reviewers? And if so, do we have a plan to create more robust uh, recruitment? That is a great question. We're actually undertaking that project right now, Machiko and I. Um, we have reached out to all of our experts that have contracts to now also encourage them to become consultants. So before a quality of care case gets referred to the field office, all of our cases requiring um, do require that they get reviewed by a consultant that has the same expertise and knowledge in the same field of, of what the allegations are involving um, this um, particular case. So we have reached out to all of our consultants that are experts at this time um, that serve more at a later time in the investigation to bring them on to conduct initial case reviews. And uh, we also reached out to 34 uh, physicians that have the expertise in overprescribing cases, which is something that I come with as far as experience. Sorry, one last question. Um, did you say that we were planning on having our own expert reviewer training? or Because when I did it several years ago, it was combined with the medical board, and it would have been nice to have our own that was you know, more in line with what we do with the OMBC. So just wanted to ask about that too. That is correct. Um, that is the goal, the intention. I did have a preliminary conversation with the Attorney General's office so that we can work on doing that. Uh, previously in my role with the Physical Therapy Board of California, we actually hosted that um, the last couple of months that I was there to conduct a, a training for them, which has sort of um, provided me the idea to bring that along with me as well. So it's just a conversation, but it is definitely another project in the horizon for enforcement. Any additional comments from board members? This is Claudia. Hi, um, I was looking at the website, Erica, and I do see that uh, I do see the online complaint form, the link. I would um, recommend that um, somewhere we tell the public that they're also able to look up licenses to make sure that if it's a, in fact a DO or an MD. I know under um, our website, there is a license verification link but uh, it's hard for the public to put one and one together. Uh, I would just wanna make that suggestion, somehow integrate that so they themselves can, in fact, 
uh, verify if it's in fact a deal they're dealing with. Um, and that can be pretty easy to do. Um, there's also under consumers, under the tab for a website, there is a, an enforcement actions um, timeline. And uh, it does list the licensee, the license number, and uh, what kind of action we took. I've never actually seen that link before. Um, can you maybe speak on that? I'm not sure if you're aware, but it does look like we do publish, uh, publish publicize uh, our actions as a board and we do list the name of physicians. Absolutely. Um, we do have a spreadsheet that Corey actually puts together every time he files any kind of disciplinary proceeding and um, it is in our um, and let me remember if I remember correctly the pathway. Um, we just spoke about this yesterday, as a matter of fact. Um, it is in our consumer tab and then under disciplinary actions. Is that correct, Corey? Yeah, I think we're going to continue with the consumer and disciplinary actions. I think it's under consumers and then there is a tab for enforcement actions. It's its, its own tab. Enforcement actions. Uh, yes, it should be. We should have it under our on our website under con the consumer tab. It's either disciplinary actions or there's another tab. It, but what it what it does is it shows our quarterly uh, disciplinary actions or any actions taken, either an accusation that's filed or uh, an, uh, probation is ended or if we've revoked or someone surrendered. It should it should show specifically who that is and then a link. There's a link from the license number to the actual Breeze lookup page um, where those documents would be found. That's great. So it adds more another level of transparency for the public. Absolutely. Just to add to that also, Claudia, um, when you look up a physician doing a license verification, um, their status uh, above will say current if they have a current and valid license. Um, in addition, the secondary status will usually prompt our consumers to identify whether they're on probation, for example, have been suspended, revoked. And right underneath it, there is a section that's a titled um, administrative discipline and you have the link to the actual document there. So um, like I said earlier, our accusations are the first public document that go, um, that is exactly where they would be at under the license verification of that physician. Um, we would, we always re, you know, direct our consumers to look there if they want a copy of that. And then following the accusation, if um, the d discipline occurs, um, that gets updated to include the disciplinary proceeding. Thank you so much. Any other board member comments? Okay, I will now entertain uh, comments from members of the public and we do have some members of the public in the room now. Uh, this is the moderator. Do you want to um, take uh, in-person public comments before WebEx? Yes. Any in-person public comment on this agenda item? No. Okay, no, no comment from members of the public that are present. Uh, moderator, if you can open for the online panel. All right, uh, this is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A panel for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. And thank you, and we will go ahead and move on to agenda item number eight, which is discussion and possible action regarding hearings. Agenda item number eight. <clears throat> Dr. Bahari, I think we still have some more updates. Oh, I'm sorry. Back have to that. Update then. from Corey. Oh, that's from right. He's sitting right in front of me. <laughs> Sorry about that, Corey. Dr. Bahari's just upset. That's an unceremonious dismissal from the board here. 
I would like to take this time, Dr. Bahari, to thank you and the board for the time that I've had to serve and, and to be part of the, the Osteopathic Medical Board. It's been an honor. I've learned a tremendous amount, and uh, I hope that my time has served the board and, and the public well. And, that, um, and so thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, with pro probation statistics, this will be my shortest report ever. So uh, here we go. Um, I'll just read this off here. So for the first, for probation, we've had for the first and second quarters, uh, we had two additional licensees placed on probation and two licensees successfully completed probation and one probation terminated, revoked, bringing the total number of licensees on probation uh, to 33 at the end of the second quarter. And uh, these licensees were placed on probation for various causes. Of the 30, 33 licensees on probation, nine probationers continued to toll as they were either residing out of state or having an inactive license status. So that number hasn't changed for quite some time. I think, I think we had a, last fiscal year, we had one of them that was on tolling for a, 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 like maybe six years and they finally surrendered. So. Um, and then of the 24 licensing that were not tolling, six were enrolled in participating in the board's drug and alcohol recovery monitoring program at the end of the second quarter, equaling about 25% of all licensees on probation. One licensee completed the alcohol recovery monitoring program in the first quarter. So I can say with really confidence that the Maximus program is doing a really, really excellent job. And, and, and even after I leave, I would continue to, I would, I would say, um, in all confidence that, that that's a program that, that the board should continue to use. Um, there has hardly been any um, recidivism with the individuals in the program. Uh, currently, there's no problems. Everybody's in compliance. Um, so it's, and we do have, I think, because it's such a good program, we do have individuals who are not on probation who go into it. They say, look, this is, and they've been very successful as well. So. Uh, additionally, the board revoked the probation of one licensee due to non-compliance with his probationary terms and conditions. His license was revoked by default decision. Um, there, and there's one current open investigation initiated on a probationer in the first quarter. So uh, we did have one individual who went on probation that he did absolutely nothing um, on his terms and conditions. He had been on probation several times in the past. You know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, we had to take action on him. It took a while, but we got him to, you know, we got his license to be, I think it was by default, actually, that he, he just didn't respond. So, and that's my report. Any questions? Any questions from board members? Corey, this is Claudia. That's the fastest report ever. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. No, 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 this is, I'm just kidding with you. I appreciate all your work and you've always been very detailed. So I just wanted to thank you for your service and it's been a pleasure working with you and I wish you well. Uh, the thank medical you. board is lucky to have you. Thank you, Claudia. Corey, this is Gore. I would like to thank you as well. Uh, you're going thank to be you. missed. Uh, I wish you all the best. Congratulations with your new position. Thank you. I can only echo them. This is Elizabeth Jensen. I think you've been on the entire time I have, Corey. So it's been many years and it's been wonderful working with you and your thorough reports. Good luck in your future. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Is there any comment, any public comment uh, from members of the public in the room regarding this agenda item? Uh, well, can we go back and maybe have another comment for? Oh, back for to the board. Sorry, I apologize. Um, in terms of, um, I think, Corey, can you can you maybe tell us really briefly the transition? It looks like we now are using Breeze as well to submit our um, our votes for for the board in terms of different cases. Can you maybe speak on that and, and how that's working for you? I know you're going to hand and everything over to the next person. But is that is that working? Is it making it more efficient from your experience? I, I'm sorry, I can't good hear that. The very question well. was, um, yeah, as we started you you started sending the board in terms of um, 
our ability to vote through the breeze uh, breeze system yeah. Oh Recently, yeah, yeah. Months. Yeah, I just wanted to hear from you um, how that's working, and um, how efficient are we being? Oh, oh I think is, it's is working it fine. I think that I, I'm, but I don't know if I should say some of the voters haven't used it yet, so I don't know if it's a problem with it. I was going to send out an email to see if there was a problem with people logging in. Have any of the board members okay. have any problem logging into the system? Um, well, I think it's worked it really little... well for mm -hmm. me. Yeah, it's a little confusing getting on board, so I recommend all the board members to just uh, reach out to Machiko. And um, for me, I'll speak for myself. It's it's been it's been great just being able to log in and getting all those documents. I think it's also a um, good okay. thing for the board to to do because of you know uh, we keep the public's uh, information um, uh, more secure. Erica Calderon, if I can uh, step in in here, I do have some procedures for that. Um, so if anyone is um, needing those, you can definitely reach out to me. Um, I can also provide a little bit of training for you um, and guide you on how to do that. So through the Breeze website, you log into your account and then um, you get redirected to the area for mail vote or it's considered mail ballot vote. And right. it's super easy, um, but we do have procedures for that if you need it. All right. Thank you so much again. I, th I think this is Cor Corey. Um, I think that going forward, it will be much. Easy, be, this will be much easier for the board to uh, to tally the votes and record the votes and to uh, you know follow up on 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 the voting patterns. Uh, I do know that uh, the director will get you know my past experience with other directors. The directors do get calls from the legislator wanting to know how the board members vote, and they need to, so we need to record that, um, and this will make it much easier. Any more comment from board members? Okay, we'll open up for public comment. Any public comment from members of the public that are here? No, seeing no comment. Moderator, is there anyone requesting public comment? This is a moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access those features and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please. And thank you, and thank you, Corey, once again. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bahari. Uh, move on to bullet item E on the executive director's report. Thank you. I just have a few more updates, I promise. This is a really extensive report. Um, Happy uh, to report on the Osteopathic and Physicians and Surgeons of California Association, also known as OPSC, and the Federation of State Medical Boards, FSMB. Um, we do have Holly Macris here with us today, the new director of OPSC, so I'd like to go ahead and point her out to you in the room back there. Um, she is here in attendance along with Cassandra Mallory, the OPSC Senior Director of Membership. In terms of updates, I am uh, I was fortunate enough to attend OPSC's directors meeting early on in November, and Holly and I have met on a couple of, of occasions already, and we do plan to meet quarterly at a minimum basis. In addition to that, uh, board staff and myself are planning to attend OPSC's 2023 Fun in the Sun, Rekindling the Joy of Practicing Medicine Conference, which will be hosted in Coronado from February 23rd through February 26th. We are planning to host a booth um, and that will allow us to promote our social media, media accounts and allow for us to be more transparent in that aspect. In regards to the Federation of State Medical Boards, FSMB, I'm excited to report that staff from OMBC and OPSC have received training on January 12th on the Federation Credentials Verification Services. We found this training to be extremely informative, especially for licensing staff. 
We were able to get an idea of how the verification process occurs and how all of these records are obtained, verified, and transmitted to all the different state licensing boards. I will be attending the Administrators in Medicine Executive Directors FSMB meeting virtually on January 30th and 31st, and staff and I are planning to attend FSMB's 2023 Annual Educational Meeting, which will be hosted this year in Minneapolis, Minnesota, from May 4th through May 6th. Um, I do like to say if any of you board members are interested in attending either of those conferences, you can please reach Machigo or myself. We'd like to have you join us. Um, I do have just very two more short updates and uh, we will open it up for comments and questions. Um, the, last, the next two updates are an update on the Controlled Substance Utilization Review, also known as CARES. The only update I have for you today is that 2020's AB 3330 authorized fee changes to the original $6 annual CARES fee collection at the time of renewal. Effective April 1st, 2021, the fee was increased to $11 annually. And effective April 1st, 2023, the fee will now be decreased back to $9 annually. I won't be going over the statistical reports that were provided by DOJ, but those have been um, provided to you in your board meeting materials. Lastly, just a quick update on the Department of Healthcare Access and Information Survey, also known as HCI. In July of last year, this survey was implemented in Breeze. A month after it was implemented, the board started to receive complaints from our licensees who had not completed the survey, indicating that their employers were concerned that they showed to be non-compliant with the survey on their physician and surgeon's license profile. And that prompted us to go ahead and create a new separate transaction in Breeze to allow licensees to update the survey at any time of the year instead of waiting for their renewal cycle. At this time, this doesn't conclude my very extensive director's first director's report. As you can see, a lot has been done in these very first two months. Um, I will reiter reiterate that I am honored to be here today and that I am looking forward to take on the Osteopathic Medical Board of California to a new other level. Time, I would be happy to answer any more questions you may have and open it up for any more comments. Any questions or comment from board members? Just a quick comment. I appreciate you mentioning board's participation in different functions or events. There was a previous board that I was on before this, which was a healing arts board, and I was able to attend an event, and there was a specific conference or set-aside discussion just for public members, which I found very helpful. So thank you for bringing that up. Appreciate that. Hi, this is Claudia. Uh, I wanted to check in with you on, you mentioned there was training from the Federation of State Medical Boards. I'm, I'm a little confused as to what the training was about. Does this have to do with the compact licensing? Uh, if you can maybe speak on that briefly. It's actually in regards to the uh, verification documents that are submitted for licensure requirements. So they put together, um, licensees are able to um, create an account with FSMB and um, through that process, they indicate uh, what school they attended, what postgraduate training course they're attending, and this program will then go out and gather the necessary documents to provide to the licensing boards for their license um, application process. So they are certified, their first source obtained uh, directly from the, the provider, the source, so they go straight to the postgraduate training um, directors and um, obtain that information, and then they compile all of that information and provide it to all the licensing boards to expedite, essentially, the process for the application. Okay, got it. And then one other thing, um, on the CURES, I was under the impression that the CURES system was gonna be replaced with the new system. Um, I'm not sure that's still happening, or maybe I'm misunderstood. But I wanted to ask you in terms of uh, the logging of prescriptions by DOs, how is the board getting noticed if there is concerns of somebody abusing uh, prescriptions through cures? 
I think the question was, how does the board um, get notified a, if, if a physician is abusing, either prescribing excessively or them yes. themselves? Okay. The, the only way general. that we would know is through the submission of a complaint. Um, we do get complaints from all different sources, um, patients themselves, uh, family members. Uh, we have received uh, complaints from other licensees, especially emergency doctors that will run a cures on a patient that is presented. Um, other, you know, RNs, uh, triage nurses, um, pharmacists that fill prescriptions, um, since everyone is required to run their patients, they do sometimes prompt the initiation of a complaint. We have also received complaints, or we do technically sometimes receive complaints from the DA directly, investigators that are already investigating cases. Um, so it, it's through the submission of a complaint that we come in, in, in contact with that allegation. Understood. Would it be possible to, I know this is asking maybe too much because it's building systems, but is there any safeguards within CARES that can potentially uh, set some kind of alert for the for the board if um, maybe they don't have a jurisdiction on this? But I'm thinking out loud here, if there's a way for, for somebody to alert us if the CARES is noticing a very high increase in prescribing. I'm not a physician, so I don't know if that's how that works, but it seems like it could be logical to do. Great question. Um, there is no alerts that directly notify the boards, but CARES is actually a database that's been developed for the physician. And uh, there are alerts within that system to alert the physician or any health um, provider who is prescribing to a, physician, uh, to a patient um, from the first time that they prescribe that actual patient presents in that physician and or licensee's profile. And there are safety mechanisms within the CURES database that prompts a, a physician to be alerted. Um, an example of that would be a patient who has, um, who is um, obtaining drugs from more than one physician at a time. So a doctor, doctor shopping situation or someone who is receiving more than 90 milligrams of morphine equivalency. Um, there are some alerts that get um, put on on that physician's profile once they log on, um, notifying them, hey, you may want to look at your patient before you prescribe. Okay, thank you. That's great. I appreciate that information. Any other comment from members of the board? Any comment from members of the public who are present regarding that agenda item? No comment from members of the public that are here. Moderator, any comment from members of the public who are online? This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A panel for public comment. Members of the public, uh, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon, look at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand icon. And I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. All right, thank you. Before we move on to agenda item number eight, let's take a quick, uh, like a five minute break. <clears throat> 